Welcome to Wrestling With Heart, a podcast looking at pro wrestlers giving back to their community. Join me, Stanley Carr, as I interview wrestling's hottest names who use their platforms as entertainers to raise awareness and do community service. Hello and welcome to another edition of Wrestling With Heart. This is the show where we talk with professional wrestlers and professional wrestling personalities about their lives in and outside of the ring as well as doing acts of charity work, community service, volunteering, and spreading positivity. We're always about the positivity here on the show. And I've got a very special guest with me today. He is an independent wrestling personality, manager, podcast host, and uh, he's done a lot of stuff for the community, is a part of the organization Wrestling for Charity, and uh, he's got a podcast called Wrestling and Everything Coast to Coast. Pleased to welcome the one and only Buddy Sotelo Esquire. Welcome, Buddy, to Wrestling with Heart. Thank you very much. Uh, Stanley or Stan, what do you prefer? Either one is fine with me. All right, Stan, I'll, I'll call you Stan. You remind me of Stan Lee from the uh, from Marvel Comics. Yes, that, that, yes. Um, the uh, legend himself. Yes. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I am based here in Northern California, where I've done most of my career uh, here as a professional wrestling manager for uh, federations such as the All Pro Wrestling Federation, uh, California Championship Wrestling, Big Time Wrestling, uh, Supreme Pro Wrestling, and Pro Wrestling Iron, and now Wrestling for Charity. So I've gotten gotten around to as a, as a manager to a lot of those uh, a lot of those a lot of the Bay Area feds and Northern California feds. Yeah, I mean just. Working all over that circuit, I mean, that's how you get experience. That's how you build up a, a you know, a resume. Was was wrestling something you always were into growing up? Yes, I, I, my brother and I. My brother's a year older than I am, and we uh, grew up watching um, Pat Patterson and uh, what was known as Big Time Wrestling in the the Roy Shire promotion here in Northern California. And so I watched a lot of Pat Patterson, um, Jimmy Snuka, um, Peter Maivia, who, as we know, is the uh, the grandfather of The Rock, Rocky Soulman Johnson, who was The Rock's father, um, fought a lot of matches. Uh, Ray Stevens was a huge guy here in the Bay Area. I mean, he was kind of the Ric Flair of, of San Francisco. Um, and we have a lot of, uh, AWA matches out here in, uh, Northern California. It was a very, uh, San Francisco is a very, uh, AWA dominated territory until the, the mid to late eighties when the WWF started coming to more shows. We rarely ever had any NWA shows. So I was always watching, um, a lot of the WWF and a lot of the AWA and then, in the late eight, kind of the mid to late eighties, we actually like about eighty three. We started getting mid south wrestling on cable, and that changed everything. All of a sudden, I started getting to see Robert Gibson, you know, the Rock and Roll Express, Ric Flair, Dusty Rhodes, um, uh, 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 Bruiser Brody, uh, Abdul the Butcher, uh, Kevin Sullivan, um, you name it. Just this whole, you know other world of wrestling came in and i just for me i just was fascinated by it my 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 parents couldn't stand it my dad who was a wrestling fan when he was a kid just was absolutely like offended to the highest degree that me and my brother loved wrestling so much and uh he never saw me perform he never he Mm -hmm. he he was just he wouldn't tell any of his friends that his son did all this stuff and and he was just really embarrassed by it and 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 that was a huge divide between my dad and myself was my love of wrestling versus how much he could stand it but what i found out was that you know even though my parents didn't like it and none of my immediate family loved it that my great grandmother granny gelney used to go to all the matches in the early days of wrestling in the Bay Area. And she used to hit the wrestlers with her purse as they would walk down the aisle. And all the wrestlers knew who she was. She was like like the, this old lady that would just, you know, whap the wrestler, the bad guys with a purse as they would walk to the ring. And they, they, they knew to look out for her. 
my my granny galne when when they would do shows at cow palace in san francisco so it go sometimes i guess it skips a generation because my kids don't care about wrestling one bit really yep not one iota so i uh, maybe they'll their kids will probably love it as much as i do who knows what what are they into what's their like passion my daughter loves minecraft can't get enough of minecraft and my son can't get enough of roblox and the the various things from roblox and i got them ipads last year for their birthdays and they have not put those things down ever since so they 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 really uh, my my daughter i can get into comics a little bit she's she does enjoy marvel she's an amazing artist but my son not he's more he, he all that stuff just kind of bores him and and wrestling just doesn't interest them at all which mm. is is always interesting to me because i've tried to make it look i i want them to love the things that they want to love because my dad didn't let me do that he, yeah. he never let me enjoy the things that i wanted to enjoy so i want them to enjoy it. i don't want to force them into right. watching wrestling but they just really don't have much of an interest in it, unfortunately, or yeah. maybe fortunately, who knows? It's crazy. It's a crazy business. So I'm not sure that they're missing out by much, you know, if they, if they choose to follow something else. Yeah. I mean, I like to say wrestling is for everyone and it can be for everyone, but sometimes, you know, it's tough to, when you hear like the, the negative stuff that surrounds it, it's kind of like hard to really like, you know, Stanley, get interested in Stanley. Two weeks ago, I bear. I was the funeral service for Tony Jones. Do you know Tony Jones at yes, all? Yes. Yeah. He was. He was a good friend of mine, and he was on the podcast, my podcast number. He's guest number forty three. He was one wow. of my earliest guests because I wanted to have him on there, and he was one. Of, that that was one of his last interviews that he did was mm. with me. Um, I've had to do funerals or talk about the deaths of of five of the people six different people that i've worked with and so when i say it's a hard business i really mean it it's bad enough that you know uh you know dreams are shattered or femurs get shattered but but to see people like mark smith mark the bison smith die roland alexander die boom boom Kamini die mike lockwood die tony jones die and virgil flynn die those are all friends of mine and they all died and and it was it was it, it's it's a rough business to know that many people i don't know that many people on my basketball teams who have died or that that i played softball with that have yeah. died and yet in wrestling a lot of people die fast and sooner than you expect it's just devastating uh to hear about somebody that you looked up to growing up that you really enjoyed you know whether that's a wrestler or a musician or some kind of artist or athlete you know they're no longer with us they're no longer around and it's just it's hard to really get over that loss because you were just you idolize these people you see what these people are doing and it's just heartbreaking to hear whenever somebody passes well if you saw the uh the iron claw Mm -hmm. You also realize that wrestling is just filled with these people that live on the extreme that are using doing things that the average person can't do, and they live in such a, a, a high fame environment that when the fame is suddenly removed from them, it's not easy for them to then cope with life without the stardom without the 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 ad, adulation in fact um i i'm sure you've seen the wrestler mm -hmm. and 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 I, I do the my podcast a lot many times with evan ginsburg who is a, a one of the executive producers for the wrestler and i thought one of the 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 biggest messages about the wrestler is how addicting the sound of the crowd is and to know that you've manipulated a crowd by doing the things that you do best in the ring it's it's bigger than a drug it's bigger than anything that you can get anywhere which is why people go through so much 
to be performers. I mean, whether you're a musician, whether you're an actor, whether you're a, a sports performer or an athlete, the sound of applause, or if you're a heel manager, the sounds of the booze, you know, the fact that you're able to get people to suspend their belief and to believe in you and the product you're selling. It's one thing about wrestling is that you're not selling anything else when you're out there in the ring. You're selling what you have to offer, what you can bring to fans and to the product in the ring. And the acceptance of it is a huge boost. The rejection of it is crushing. And that's why some people, when wrestling goes away, can't handle the lack of a spotlight and the lack of the ability to perform and to get that emotional feedback, that it destroys them. Now, others like Tony Jones, I mean, he was fine with, you know, being retired. It just, his heart just gave out on him. My friend Mark Smith was working out in the ring and he just had a congenital heart condition that just could have killed him anytime. He could live with it to his 80s or it could have killed him in his 20s. Instead, it got him when he was in his 40s. You know, um, yeah. none of the ones that I, I worked with were drug related or because of, you know, uh, 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 an accident, you know, related to, to, to intoxication or anything like that. It just, uh, you know, uh, Virgil Flynn, who was a mm -hmm. tremendous high flyer here in the Bay Area, he had a um, pulmonary embolism and a stroke in his brain. And even though he was only in his uh, early 30s, he was in tremendous shape and he died. If you, if you had me make a list of people in my life that I thought I would outlive, I would have never put people like Mark Smith, Virgil Flynn, and Tony Jones on a list of people that I thought I'd outlive. But mm -hmm. that's, you don't make that choice and you don't get that choice. But I think all of them would say they wouldn't do anything different than what they did to, 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 be, to do what they've done in the ring or do what they did in the ring. They still would have done everything they could have done to be wrestlers, to be performers. And they wouldn't trade that in, even for a longer life. Yeah, I mean, it's all about sacrifices. You have to give up certain things in order to pursue, like, any profession. And wrestling was, like, their their passion, what they wanted to do. And it comes with a price, unfortunately. But for you, when you wanted to break in the business, what was it about wrestling to you that was like, I've got to do this? I I love I love fighting. I love fighting the fighting arts any way you can slice it, whether it's Batman stage fights, you know, with Adam West stage fighting, um, or whether you're talking about UFC, or you're talking about boxing, or you're talking about kickboxing, or you're talking about wrestling, or you're talking about shoot fighting or you're talking about pain craze, or you're talking, I mean, you name it. I, I watched it and, and I've been, I mean, I remember UFC number one, the very first ultimate fighting championship match pay-per-view that they did, you know, and a lot of people did, never saw that or saw the humble beginnings from it. But I, I find that, 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 that fighting is an amazing human concept the way that we do it and the fact that we can stage fight and that we can act fighting is a tremendous skill it is not something to just be oh well it's fake okay and therefore you just discount it because it was prearranged and it's fake therefore there's no skill to it and there's no there's no reason to watch it. That's the most ludicrous thing in the world. That's mm -hmm. like saying that Bruce Lee beat up everybody in every movie he ever fought. Of course not. He didn't touch any of those guys. You know, he came, a, you know, an eighth of an inch from hitting them in their face. But he didn't haul off and hit everybody in the face in every movie or no one would want to act with him. Jackie Chan 
you know, same kind of thing. It takes more skill to try to punch somebody and to come this close to hitting them than it does to just haul off and hit somebody. I know that because I, I in training, that's where you really get the skill from, is not potatoing people, is not knocking them senseless, because every match would last two seconds and your careers would last about as long. No, the idea is drawing it out, making it believable. You know, everyone thought, you know, Adam West was some great, you know, fighter from Batman or that William Shatner was was an incredible combatant because uh, Captain Kirk could fight so well in Star Trek. But what it really was was really good stage fighting that people believed in and people wanted to believe in and would suspend belief while watching. And I, I love that. I love that element from like comics when I was a, a kid and I read comics as a kid. I love that from video games. Because that's also a part, I mean, in video games, you're not really taking a gun out and shooting an alien, you know, uh, from outer space or taking a sword and stabbing a dragon in the heart. You're not really doing that. But by the, when you're in that game, you are doing that. Mm -hmm. Your mind wants to make you believe that. So I believe in the ability to make people believe these things. And that's the best part about wrestling is that it's 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 making people believe that the combat in front of them is real even though deep in their minds they know it's not you know the suspension of belief and the color that's involved in all of wrestling that that the costumes are are outrageous that the the, the I love 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 mass wrestlers love them just love them. Not just the Lucha ones so much. Although I, I like Lucha wrestlers, but I love the old style mass wrestler. The big tough guy who didn't say anything and just wore a mask and you didn't know who he was. He's from parts unknown, you know, weight unknown and would just come in as an ominous presence and not do much, not say much, but beat the heck out of somebody. Um, we're talking about like the assassins. Um, we're talking about like the medics or the interns or my favorite, the spoiler. I don't know if you ever yep. remember John, Dar John Don Jardine as the spoiler. Mm -hmm. That's the mass superstar. You know, these were guys that, uh, uh, Mr. Wrestling. Um, uh, uh, these were guys that I just really really loved and that was one of the things i always tried to manage throughout my career was to have somebody in a mask that just was my big bodyguard and i would do all the talking for and he would do all the enforcing for and so i i created one in mark smith as super destroyer 2000 and then later i created a a, a guy by the name of paul isadora who's seven feet tall and I put a mask on him and I called him Mr. Massacre and and they were great just really wonderful characters for me and I, the best part too is that I could manage those guys again by just putting the mask on somebody else and calling him you know Mr. Ma Mr. Massacre 2 or, or Super Destroyer 3000 or something along those lines you know the cool thing about mass wrestlers is like back in the old days if you lost a match uh, sometimes you'd have to leave the territory, but you could come back. Oh yeah, as a masked man. Absolutely, that's what we did with Mark Smith. Mark Smith, when I first met him for All Pro Wrestling, I don't know if you're that familiar with Mark Bison Smith, but when I first joined APW, um, I was you know just uh, well how I how I joined APW was uh, All Pro Wrestling. It was in Hayward, California, and I was going through relatively rough time in my life where I I lost a job and, and and I broke up with my fiance and I was just staying up late at night and I saw a, a, a news program for this school that taught people how to be professional wrestlers. And I was an attorney, I still am an attorney and I called them up. I said, you know, I can't afford your manager's class right now, but if you need legal help, I would trade in my legal skills to you and rework your contracts and, and, and your disclaimers and your online stuff for uh, teaching me how to become a manager. And so I met with, with Roland Alexander and Donovan Morgan and Mike Modest 
And they said, yeah, we can use your skills. And so I would drive out to Hayward on Saturday mornings and get the tar beaten out of me by Vinnie Massaro and also the lady who, had, who was learning how to become a valet at the time, one Sarah Del Rey, okay? Mm -hmm. I used to call her Sarah the Stiff because she would just haul off and wallop me. While she was learning how to like pull her punches, she would beat the living S out of me mm -hmm. by because she didn't know how to pull her punches. So instead of slapping me in the face, she would like hit me with all of her strength right on the side of my ear with the, like her arm because she was she and and the one time she gave me a low blow that really was a low blow. And it wasn't, she just missed. She was supposed to like not go all the way. And she walked me right where it, it counted. Uh, wow. Yeah, it's, hey, look, she's now the 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 uh, director of female development in the WWE. So she's come a long mm -hmm. way. And a lot of those people <clears throat> in ABW turned out to be big, big stars, including Mark Smith. But when I came and I watched Mark in a couple of matches before I started managing, the thing was, he was doing all these great moves and he looked fantastic, but the crowd went mild. They didn't care. As a face, he did not get anybody over. And I said, the way to make him a bad guy would be one, put a mask on him. And two, mm -hmm. let me do all the talking for him because people are going to hate me. They're going to hate this lawyer that comes in and bugs them and, and to generate heat at the time. Now, this was before 9-11, so keep this in mind. So I, I portrayed a, a lawyer from New York, I, I like a mobster attorney from New York, because everyone was all into the mobster stuff in the early, you know, in the late 90s, early 2000s, the Sopranos and Casino mm -hmm. and Heat and like, you know, uh, Godfather and all this other stuff. People were really into that mafia thing. So I said, try to play off of that, you know, become an Italian mobster from New York City. And I used to wear a Yankees tie. And I used to say that that all my clients were all these famous New Yorkers like uh, Leona Helmsley and Woody Allen and George Steinbrenner. Oh, and this real estate developer named Donald Trump. I used to say, he's my client. You know, I was the I was the personal attorney for for Donald Trump during that mm -hmm. time. And 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 it just the 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 what was great was and this is the best thing you can do for yourself when you are into wrestling. And too much of it now everyone uses their real names and there's no characters in wrestling. But for me, the character of Buddy Satello was everything I could not stand about attorneys having worked with them my entire life. And I would just pour all of that into the shell of Buddy Satello. Buddy is everything I cannot stand about every attorney I've ever met. And so when other people hate Buddy Satello, it's fantastic because it's like, okay, you folks hate everything that I hate about attorneys. And I'm just going to keep pushing that in your face. And and as someone else described it, he said, is, is Russ really that annoying as Buddy Satello? Is he like that in real life? He said, my friend said, Buddy is pretty much Russ turned up to volume 11. You just, you, you turn up the volume all the way and then just break the knob. And that is what your wrestling character really is. If you, if you want it to be successful, you take the personality of yourself and you jam it up to the highest extent that you possibly can and break off the knob. And that is what will make you successful in wrestling. Nobody wants just a mild guy that doesn't do anything. I mean, wrestling is meant to be outrageous. Meant to, wrestling mm -hmm. is meant to be over the top. Wrestling is meant to be loud and, and, and constant, you know, a barrage of the senses. That's why I like it. Yeah. I don't like it's stuff. It's escapism. Just, yeah. But I don't like something that just is moderate and just goes calmly, straightforward you know, in a, in a relaxed sense. I like the fireworks. I like the explosions. I like the loud music. And I like, and, 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 and as people say, when we get older, 
all that stuff is going to wear you out. You're No, as I get older, I want maybe even more of it because, mm -hmm. you know, I've seen so much <clears throat> of it already that you have to, you, you do have to go a pretty good length to, to impress me in the ring or, you know, in a show because I've seen so much of it, you know, uh, uh, but, but I'm always craving that. I'm always craving the next great match. I'm always craving the net to see the next great rivalry and to see guys. That was a great part. And still is a great part of indie wrestling is watching guys go from nothing to becoming big stars. And I've seen guys become big stars. I met Dilip Singh, better known as the great Kali, literally right as he got off the boat from India. I mean, right as he got off the plane from India, he showed up at all pro wrestling. And he didn't speak a word of English and he couldn't, he didn't know a body slam from a bear hug. And uh, APW really hammered him into, you know, the basics because he just didn't know anything about that. But guys like seeing Mark Smith go places, um, uh, another guy that just is really, I thought was, was, was a really wonderful guy to work with um, is, uh, uh timothy thatcher you know yep. he he was he worked with us in california championship wrestling couldn't be a nicer guy and went from being just someone that nobody knew about to being a main eventer um uh brian cage i worked with mm -hmm. uh while he was just you know almost average looking in size as opposed to the the monster he is today he's um, all jacked yeah and bailey is another yep. lady that I worked with when she was Davina Rose, just starting off, you know, and wrestling for charity. Um, uh, uh, you know, it's always great to see guys get that opportunity. Uh, the Reno Scum I managed for uh, for about uh, six months over in California Championship Wrestling. Um, uh, uh, so to see these guys become stars after seeing them work the uh, 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 lower ends of the indie feds. And sometimes, you know, in front of crowds where the wrestlers themselves outnumbered the people who are in the audience, you know, and see them still put out as much um, uh, effort as they could is uh, something that, 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 that I always appreciated and, 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 and was always a big fan and keeps me coming back even after, you know, the ups and downs of, of, of having to bury Tony Jones a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. I mean, with all the sadness and the tragedies and the heartbreak, I mean, it's very rewarding to do what you're doing because you're seeing the development of these people that are becoming national names. I mean, maybe even know, legends. Yeah. And I, Hall of I, Famers. I had Joe do a dive out on, you know, I, I worked, I worked shows with a guy named the prototype. Oh, okay, John Cena. I guess if you if you might know him better as John Cena, you mm -hmm. know, uh, 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 Brian Danielson was known as the American Dragon and worked a number of shows with us. You know, you don't know at the time who's going to become a legend. You don't. You don't. And and sometimes you know things will will fall into place, and sometimes you'll see tragic stories of people that were legends. That aren't anymore. And again, uh, Mike Lockwood, better known as Crash Holly, is an example of that. And it was very hard for him to come down from being a legend and and being, you know, a, a big deal in the WWE, winding up, you know, doing indie shows again. He never recovered from it, and 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 it wound up taking his life. Well, and he took his life because it was it was too much for to to lose that that stardom you have to be prepared you have to be mentally prepared not just to be a star but what happens if you aren't a star anymore mm -hmm. and, and that's why you always got to have something else you got to do it's so hard i only know a couple of wrestlers who've managed to keep it from being to have managed to make wrestling their day job and the vast majority of them no matter how talented they are have had to go on and do something else yeah and and it that's the reality of it yeah, it's it's a it really is a tough business, but you know, the fruits of their labor will eventually rise to the top. You know, eventually, if they just keep putting in the work and find that plan B to get them to 
help. Well, you got to not get injured. Going. That's uh, that's the other big thing is that you've got to somehow make it through, and you've got to fight through the injuries you do get. Sarah Del Rey had two incredibly difficult knee injuries that she had to recover from. And I remember how hard she worked at rehabbing to get back into it. I know Bailey has had some incredibly Mm -hmm. huge injuries and she didn't stop. Mark Smith had some huge injuries and didn't stop. You can't, despite, you know, the, the, your body's calling card saying you should stop. If you don't, if you do stop, then, then wrestling will move past you. Because there's just too many other people that want it too badly that will fight even when they are busted up. Yes. And and if you aren't able to do that, then then the industry moves by. And you know, unfortunately, the floor is littered with a lot of people who, you know, had a lot of potential, but because, you know, they missed out, they couldn't do a show because they got hurt, someone else took their spot on the show and got the applause and suddenly they're the ones that move upwards to the WWE and you don't. And, and it's, it's, it's very difficult then to, I also think that a number of the guys that I worked with would have done really well had AEW been in existence because they were smaller guys and AEW is more open to the smaller guys. Whereas in the WWE, the only opportunity they had was if they were like Dilip, you know, as big as Dilip or or someone as big as as Mark Smith, you know, you, the the average sized guy couldn't get in to 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 the WWE when the and that was you know in the early two thousands was when WWE took over WCW and pretty much became a monopoly. There wasn't a lot of other options for for guys to take so. So, uh, you know, that, that, and, that, that closed, the closed door was tough for a lot of people in that early 2000s. And nowadays you see more wrestling organizations pop up and some of them even have TV deals now. It's more accessible to watch these smaller promotions than it used to be. I mean, TNA and Ring of Honor were on Spike TV and uh, the network channels, essentially. Um, and of course, WWE was on cable. So, but now you've got all these, you got AEW, you've got TNA, you have New Japan, uh, and all these other companies that you can even watch some on YouTube now, which is incredible. NWA was doing YouTube for a long time, and I think Mm -hmm. they're going to go back to it. Yeah. I mean, you just need the, the, to record a decent show, you pretty much need, you know, a a mid-level iPhone. You don't, you don't need, you know. The, the camera equipment that it used to cost to record a show was outrageous. And now everybody's computer and everybody's iPhone has the capacity to edit video and to, you know, put together what used to be a studio that would cost tens of thousands of dollars. Pretty much everybody has in their hands now. And so it, it doesn't come down to equipment anymore that can that determines whether or not you can make a show. It's whether you have the skill to do it. And and so we are going to see that bar lowered and the amount of wrestling. You know, when I was, I don't know when you started watching wrestling. When I started watching wrestling in the 70s, finding wrestling was a really big effort. You had to know when it was on. Yeah, there was no VCR, so you couldn't record it later. You had to watch it when it was on. It was appointment television. And in the late 70s, it went off the air because it wasn't getting any ratings. So it didn't come back until the, the early 80s. So from like the like 79 to like 83, it was really hard to find wrestling at all anywhere at any time. And, and now there's just so much of it that it's hard to decide what which one you're going to watch as mm-hmm. opposed to whether you're going to watch wrestling at all yeah i think it's fair to say we've entered in a new wrestling boom period because you've got a new wrestling boom because you've got all these different companies and different networks that want wrestling now i mean you only but is had it many... good wrestling is the question you know that, that it I'd depends watch, I, i'd rather watch one hour of really good wrestling than than 12 hours of blah wrestling you know, and that that that's that's the thing is that you know when I think about like what I used to watch 
in mid south like the one hour mid south program they used to have or the uwf when herb abrams was running it that was action packed they would have for an hour they would show you know one or two scrub matches and then have like two or three really uh, like high quality matches that you'd be really interested in instead of three hours with you know i i think that it was clock that in three hours you get about a half hour of actual in action in ring action in a typical wwe show and it's stultifying to try to you know watch three hours when there's so little going on and they show you a replay of what you just saw and so forth you know i i, I think that, that that sometimes less would be more if what they gave less of was of higher quality well also to um you got to take into the account the soap opera element of wrestling as well. That was also popular back in the nineties and two thousands. And I think it's still pretty important to have, you know, that cliffhanger of what's going to happen next week that keeps people engaged with the story, but tell the story in the ring, tell that story in the ring. And you can do that with ring based activity, as opposed to the interview segment, which now has gone and, and especially the pre-match like hullabaloo that goes on before a guy even walks into the ring. Like the WWE can kill 20 minutes by having a guy come into the ring, grab a mic and chew the microphone for 10 minutes before any action actually happened. And that isn't how you tell a story. Story can be told in the ring with what's going on in the ring. And I love it when people do that. I think that's what fans really want to see is the story being revealed by what's happening with the wrestlers and their actions ringside than it is for a guy to get on the mic and tell you what he's going to do once everything is going to happen in the ring. That's where I think there's a problem is there's an over-reliance on people talking about what they're going to do rather than getting in the ring and actually doing it. That was one of the things that was really emphasized in APW and, and in the other feds that I was in. They had a very, they, they, they really loved the Japanese standard of, of how wrestling was, was a much greater story told off the mic in the ring, as opposed to trying to do it via interviews and by, you know, chewing the mic up before you get in the ring. And, and I like that. I, you know, in you can watch new Japan wrestling, for instance, and, and, and even though you don't speak Japanese, you can still get a lot out of new Japan wrestling and pro wrestling, uh, uh, Noah and, and so forth. Whereas I think if you didn't speak English, you don't get a lot out of a WWE show you know, and maybe even an AEW show because there's so much talking that goes on and so little action. And I'd like it to, to, to go the other way around. So, you know, maybe that'll be a trend that we see maybe a little bit more of, although I think it's going the other way. I think the trend is to have guys do more talking than, than you know, actual in-ring stuff and to do that terrible deal that both the WWE and AEW do where they shrink the in action thing so they can give you a, uh, a, an ad, like, you know, much bigger ad, you know, in your face while wrestling is shrunk down to a tiny picture in picture. Yeah. Screen. yeah. That is a trend. I really don't like that. Is who, some... who are some of your favorite wrestlers to watch nowadays? Uh, well, as I said, Timothy Thatcher is a friend of mine and I, I, I love seeing him in the ring. He's fantastic. Um, I Brian Cage is a friend of mine. Love to see him in the ring. Uh, Christopher Daniels, even though he's getting on the old side, great in the ring. Um, has Brian Danielson ever delivered a, a lousy match? I don't think he ever has. No. Um, Bailey is wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, for for people that I haven't worked with, I'm a huge fan of Eddie Kingston. Mm -hmm. I think he's. He is the guy that really br br brings that believability factor to the ring um, and is a guy that, you know, he's worked so hard to get where he is. I think he had a great year last year. I thought he was 
in my opinion, the wrestler of the year. Um, but I could see uh, Swerve Strickland mm-hmm. is great to watch in the ring. He's he really brings all of it, and he's got talents in every level. Great on the mic. Um, uh, I liked MJF before he got hurt. He was he was really good in the ring. Um, and uh, you know, I'd like to see maybe a return to Braun Strowman. He was really impressive before he got hurt. So, you know, if guys can stay healthy, there's a lot of great talent, maybe some of the greatest talent now that we've ever had in the ring. But yeah. but because of this emphasis on everything is a high spot and no one can can work a move and nobody does chain wrestling anymore. Everything is just a chain of high spots. Guys just keep getting hurt mm-hmm. faster, sooner than later. And it's more of an if rather than a when guys exactly. are going to get hurt. Yeah. It's like the it's like the stuff with the ladder matches, you know, back in the 2000s, you know, late 90s with all these high risk extreme spots, you know, eventually, you know, the injuries are just going to catch up to you if you're not careful. I don't even like enough. ladder matches. I don't even find them that entertaining, to be really honest with you. Really? I could do without ladder matches and and be fine with Yeah, I really extreme garbage wrestling doesn't turn me on that much and i know how quickly it shortens wrestlers Mm -hmm. lifetimes and i will say that this one of the scariest moments that i've ever been in you know involved in ringside was one of those no hold street fight garbage match things where just you really don't know what the heck is going on and it is not as scripted as you think it is and i basically I hid in a corner while guys were hitting each other with light bulbs and barbed wire wrapped baseball bats and all of that stuff. And I was like, I just, please don't kill me. And I only knew about one spot, which is at the end where they were going to choke slam me. And I was like, okay, I'll take that choke slam. And that's the least I'm going to get out of this whole thing. Cause everybody else is just going to be battered and bloody. And I don't want any part of that. Yeah. There's only one time that I bled in the ring, and that was when um, uh, I was managing Malachi against um, uh, Adam Thornstow. And and I, the uh, um, my talent was Malachi. He was just supposed to be, you know, like saying, hey, buddy, buddy, pay attention to this. And mm-hmm. he tapped me with the microphone. But the the microphone had one of those big squares on it mm-hmm. with the logo of the yeah. federation, and the corner of the square bathed me right in the middle of my forehead, and I started bleeding all over the place. Oh wow! I was like, yeah, it was an, uh, an unintentional gig. I'm so sorry you know? that happened to you. I mean, it's- well, it just shows you how stuff happens to you in the ring. You don't even expect it. So. Right. You know, uh, right. Stuff like that. When you do, do live stuff, you never know what's mm-hmm. going to happen. That's that's true. For sure. That. Let's switch gears now and talk about the stuff you've done out of the ring. Uh, of course, you're a part of the organization Wrestling for Charity, and I know you've done a lot of charity work over the years. Tell me about what Wrestling for Charity has done uh, for the community, because I think that's a great organization. Well, uh, I I started working with Robert Butch. The guy, guy named his nickname's Butch, Robert Ha, and he um he was a photographer for APW for many years, and then he's also Reverend, um and so he put together some shows first in De Anza, and then when uh, APW kind of had a talent loss and and all pro wrestling, so uh, the death of of Roland Alexander, it still does shows, but not as frequently as they used to, so. So Butch sort of picked up the mantle from APW and and also Pro Wrestling Iron, which had gone out of business and gave a lot of those guys a chance to work shows here in the Bay Area. Um, they he, they did a, a number of shows called Troop Slam, where they raised money for the veteran of foreign wars um, uh, 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 outposts in San Jose and in Santa Clara. Uh, he's done, uh, recently, they just did a show in um, uh, Gilroy, which is in um, uh, south of San Francisco, 
the garlic capital of the world. And it was a, uh, they did a, um, a encourage uh, Latin Americans to read. And it was, uh, it was done at the, the, Gal, uh, the uh, Gilroy Library. And um, they just had a couple of short matches and instead read books to the kids, you know, in between the, the, the matches. And uh, uh, the kids really liked it and the library really liked it and, and they'll be welcome to come again. So, so Wrestling for Charity sort of has an open door policy that if you have a cause and you're looking to raise publicity for it, um, Wrestling for Charity will find a way to come out and promote your cause and let the power of wrestling and the attraction of wrestling do the selling for you. So I think that's a great idea. It's, uh, you know, something that seems to make people really happy. It engages the kids because it's hard to find something the kids are going to really be excited about in this day and age. You know, I'm telling you, like, how my kids love Roblox and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, one way to get them off of their computers and off of their screens is to show them something live that's colorful and that's exciting is what they're seeing on their iPads and on their Chromebooks. Yes. And wrestling can do that. Wrestling can do that. No doubt about that. Was there a particular event that you enjoyed being a part of with, while working for Wrestling with Charity? Yeah, I love the Troop Slam shows that I did because those are the ones that Bailey were uh, got some of her earliest uh, matches in. So working with with Bailey uh, at Troop Slam and 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 uh, uh, you know knowing that what we were doing was going to help the veteran for foreign wars was a great thing and 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 that we're expanding and and going to be doing more of these shows as time goes on the other great show that we did was um over at uh paramount's great america we the 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 amusement park there had never been a wrestling show um at uh paramount's great america and we uh we had like about two thousand fans watching us um perform and in the, the the only negative side was it was 105 degrees out there Oof. and the wrestlers the wrestlers actually said the one thing they didn't want to do was spend any time on the mat because the mat temperature itself was about 120 goodness so wrestlers would take bumps and they would get right up after they took the bump because lying on the mat would be basically like lying in a frying pan for an extended period of time. So these guys would do anything they could to like do moves that would keep them on the ropes or like they'd hit the, the mat and bounce right back up because they didn't want to have like the long headlock moves where they're, you know, being ground into the mat where you'd just be burning yourself up. But but it was still a great time and it was a really revolutionary, you know, really unique show to do that at, uh, at Paramount's Great America. So that was another great show. What gives you the most joy about giving back to your community? Um, I think that knowing that I was able to do something that I love doing. My 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 dad, who again didn't understand what I did and had has had this evil girlfriend who even understood less of what I did, they said, Why don't you be a real actor sometime? Why don't you like do Shakespeare in the park or something like that? I said, I can't do Shakespeare because I'm not, I'm not Hamlet. I'm not, you know, uh, Romeo. I'm Buddy Sotelo. I don't, nobody writes lines for Buddy Sotelo. Buddy Sotelo is what I tell him to be. And he's what I figure out on the spot. And what I see from watching fans in the stands. And insults that come right off the top of my head that I, I watch from, you know, things like Rodney Dangerfield and Henny Youngman and 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 uh, 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 Don Rickles, you know, those kind of and Mad Magazine, you know, reading insults from from Mad Magazine. So just throwing them out, you know, and 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 that sort of thing and stuff that I saw from Andy Kaufman, you know, not not a script, not like saying, you know, uh, 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 Romeo, Romeo, wherefore, you know, or, or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, tis a better thing that I do than, than, than what I've done before. You know, I don't, I don't talk in Shakespearean language. And so 
being able to do what I do best without a script and knowing that I'm entertaining people and causing them to forget about what, you know, the bills that are due, forget, forget about, you know, oh, I've got a, a root canal coming next week. Forget about, oh, I got a car payment due, you know, in a couple of weeks. You forget about all of that when you come to a wrestling show and you're just there to see the action unfold in front of you and to be entertained. And for that's all I do is entertain people by this, by this podcast, by, by my podcasts, by my performance in the ring. If all I've done is entertain people at the end of the day, that's, that's all I need to know that I did. And, and the rest is, 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 is a bonus to everybody. And I love that. Yeah, before we go, let's talk about your podcast, Wrestling and Everything Coast to Coast. How did that come come about and what made you decide to pursue that? Well, I've I've been friends with Evan Ginsberg for a long time. And same with Mike Leno, a photographer, for a very long time. And we were stuck at home during the COVID, you know, lockdowns. And he Evan lives in a one-room apartment in New York City, downtown New York City. And I have a pretty big house, but, you know, I was stuck with my kids and my wife and we were literally going insane. I was going insane, stir crazy. It was like something out of The Shining. You know, I was like beginning to get to, you know, all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy, you mm -hmm. know. And Evan was like, you know, we, we had talked about doing a talk show between the two of us, coast to coast, for years. And we were like, well, now we truly have nothing better to do. Let's just go ahead and just do it. And if anybody watches us, then that's then then we've succeeded. And before you knew it, one show turned into 100 shows, turned into 217 shows. And this show, when I put it together, we show number 218. And I haven't missed a week. I haven't missed a week in four years. I've been I've, I've done continuous shows every week and it's it's become a part of my life it's 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 become a routine it's become something that you know as as evan has pointed out it's been verbal therapy to come in sometimes and to talk about some of the things and and i've had people come in on the show like tony jones and jj mcguire who are no longer with us and now those shows become priceless uh memory memories of these friends of mine that are no longer there. And I've made friends through being through my podcast. I would have never met in real life like yourself. I mean, I, you know, no offense. I'm not headed out to, to Nashville anytime soon. And I've been through there once, but I'm not, you know, it's a 3000 mile drive. So it's not like mm -hmm. I'm going over to your house, but I wouldn't have met you had it not been through the podcast. It gives me a reason to talk to people, to open up, and to, to say, hey, would you like to be on my show? Or can I be on your show? And exactly. that's been a wonderful thing, too. It's allowed me to meet people all around the world and an and, and, and experience that I wouldn't have had if I just stayed to myself and just said, I wish I'd done a podcast. You know, that's what wrestling was all about for me, was to never say back to myself, oh, I wish I had done this. I wish I had, had taken the time out to do this. Now... And I urge that to anyone. If you've got a bucket list of any type, don't let it be a bucket list anymore. Just go ahead and do it. As ridiculous as you think it is, and as hard as you think it is, if you've got a bucket list, you'll feel so much better with your life when you say you've done that. And that's what wrestling was and, and the podcast and all of this is for me. Wow, that's well put. Uh... Buddy, this has been great getting a chance to speak with you and uh, means a lot to me, to my listeners and viewers that are watching this as well as yours, because we'll we'll do a little cross promotion here uh, for this episode. But I want to say thank you again. Uh, and uh, where can people find you and your podcast? Well, you can find Buddy Satello Esquire on Facebook. It's facebook.com slash Buddy Satello, B-U-D-D-Y-S-O-T-E-L-L-O-E-S-Q. You can find him there. Wrestling and Everything Coast to Coast is also on Facebook. 
wrestling and everything coast to coast um uh, uh all one word uh facebook.com and then you can find us on uh youtube wrestling and everything coast to coast has its own facebook uh, uh youtube channel and uh we love the listeners and we love to you know get out there and interview anyone that you know is involved in the business so if you you know someone that wants to get a little bit more promotion especially here in northern california we'd love to have them as guests on the show and and as i've always said when you've run out of absolutely every single guest that you could possibly have i'm always available to do the show again so awesome yes you're more than welcome to come back thank you so much all right take care thank you you have a great day, and, and, and one of these days we'll get you on our show so we can find out all about you, too. For sure. Thanks Thank again. Thanks, Dan. You're welcome. This is Wrestling With Heart. I hope you found this podcast to be informative and entertaining. If you did, please hit the subscribe button and look out for the next edition.